make sure you click the link to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notifications button to be notified for when my next podcast goes live. You can also follow me on my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest is. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Thank you. In the simplest form, pirates get on a ship and they hold a gun to the captain's head and say, your ship's been hijacked, we're going to Somalia now. Our job was to protect them, so we were armed security. Um, I also was a, what they call a bag dropper, so I would go and pay the pirates as well. So when they had agreed a fee with the ship owner, the insurance companies would send me out to Somalia to drop a bag with a couple of hundred million or a couple of million dollars in. These people have quit the jobs. You know, they've applied for Hunted, they've got on the show, they've left work. We obviously hack all their accounts, their social media, their mm-hmm. PCs, their laptops. I, I, I'm reading emails where they've already spent the money. You know, they've, they, they, they're, they're planning what they're doing with the hundred grand. Mm-hmm. You know, they're booking holidays, they're putting mm-hmm. deposits down on cars, and and it's it's pretty brutal. And as you can imagine, when when they get caught, they're pretty mm-hmm. aggressive as well. You know, in that in that moment of emotion where they realise there is no hundred grand anymore. Yeah. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Jordan Wiley. How are we, brother? Great. Good to see you, mate. Good to see you, mate. You've just uh, finished a marathon there. You're doing 15 marathons in 15 days. How are you feeling? Is that the fourth one today? It's the fourth one today, and I'm definitely feeling like uh, the effects. <laughs> it's, it's been pretty brutal, and uh, I probably, if I'm honest, I probably underestimated it, it being in Roni on day four, and I've got another 11 to go. What's, um, many, what's the most you've ever did in a row? I'd done one marathon before today, before before this challenge started. I did the the marathon of Afghanistan in 2018. Uh, that was the only marathon I've ever done in my life. Um, and then four days, um, four days notice, I decided I was going to do 15 in 15. It's it's the 70th anniversary of the National Trust, uh, which is the sort of charity of the national parks of the UK. Um, and they said, why don't you come and have a look around our national parks? And I said, you know what? I'll come have a look, but I'm going to run around them. Um, and here we are, four days in. <laughs> <laughs> now you're sitting here talking to me when you should be in your bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But all, all, all good, all for a great mm-hmm. cause. And, uh, you know, as we were talking off record before, it's as, it's as much about helping me as it is about helping the charities. It's great for mental health. You know, I suffer a lot with things like depression, anxiety. Mm-hmm. Uh, still take medication today, which I'm sure we'll dig into. Yeah. But really good for me being out in Scotland as well. Like, you know, I, we're up here and... Uh, it's not often you get the English saying great things about the Scottish, but I'm, for, for me, it's probably one of the the most beautiful parts of the UK. Mm-hmm. And I think Scotland, and especially the north of Scotland, it always shows me that you don't have to travel far. You don't have to travel to the other side of the world to see natural beauty because when you get up in the Cairngorms, in Loch Lomond, the national parks are just absolutely stunning. Yes. And it's, a, it's an honour to, to run around them. As it's stunning here, you've got the fresh air, you've got the scenery, and sometimes you take it for granted because it's in your own backyard. Some people will be travel all around the world to see beautiful things, oh, but yeah, Scotland, you have got it. In the top of Scotland, there's white sand, the beaches yet that I've yeah. never seen. So <laughs> it's something I would like to eventually do myself. You do massive things, Jordan. You've raised over a million pounds for charity. You like to help the kids from the war zones. Um, You've did your marathons, you've did your runs in some of the most run-down places in the world. You've got your, your rowing thing coming up this year where you're going to row also around... Where are you rowing again? So I'm rowing um, the the gateway to the Gulf of Aden. Yeah, where is that? I was going so, to say that there, but they're fucking butchered, aren't they? <laughs> so it's called the Babel Mandab Straits. Yeah, um, that's, that, that's, that's that, the one you're uh, looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going to try that. <laughs> no, so it's... Uh, it's it's the most dangerous strait of water in the world um, for various reasons, for the pirates, for the terrorists, for the sharks, um, you know, for, 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 for many different reasons. It's the busiest shipping lane in the world for, for cargo commercial ships as well. Um, so I'm going to get in my little rowing boat and, and head across there later on this year. Um, it's never been done successfully before by any person. So, you know, touch wood, fingers crossed, I can be the first person in the world to achieve that. Um, and, and hopefully the main objective this year is is to raise a quarter of a million to build a school on the Horn of Africa, mm-hmm. um, which is 27,000 child refugees there. And for me, having, you know, left school with no education, um, I've gone back to education later in life and I've found it's one of the ways that actually, certainly if you're in a war zone or a conflict environment as a child, you can inspire a lot of hope by giving them mm-hmm. access to understanding the, the wider world. Mm-hmm. And that's a great thing, mate. So massive respect goes to you for that. I always go back to the start with my guests as well and get a wee bit of more information about you and how you get involved in the life you're in. Because I know you served in the Army for over 10 years and 
Whereabouts did you grow up and stuff? Yeah, so uh, Blackpool was home for me. Um, the Las Vegas of the North. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going down there this weekend, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. For um, Easter. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great weekend, um, you know. And we were probably the victims of all the old you lot and the stag dudes and everyone else who comes to abuse our town. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, really proud to be from Blackpool. Um, I live down in Hampshire these days, but grew up in Blackpool on a on a pretty rough council estate. But I, I didn't come from you know a terrible background or anything like that. I, whatever I lacked, probably materialistically, I gained in love from from two very inspirational parents who, mm. you know, I think they installed good values in me, good morals and. You know, I was I was a, probably a bit of a naughty boy. Got in trouble with the police as a, as a youngster. A few cautions for this, that, and the other. A few nights in in the cells, but uh, you know, I wasn't I wasn't the worst child or most misbehaved. But um, unfortunately, left school as I say with no qualifications. So it was joining the army was process of elimination. You know, like a lot of people um, from sort of deprived and rundown areas, you join the military or you end up going in jail. It's mm-hmm. it's not it's not too discommon, we could say. Um, the military was for me um, and you know a lot of my friends unfortunately did go down you know the drugs and and the crime route um, still good friends today and um, it would have been very easy for me to, to slip into that uh, a lot of my cousins and family members did as well um, but for me join the army um, I guess it turned me from a boy to a man and I, I, I learned a lot about the world learned a lot about life I got to meet some incredible people and very thankful to the military for everything they've given me because I probably without a doubt made me who I am today I'm sure because you joined when you were 16 yeah joined when I was 16 so you know was serving in conflict environments by the time I was 18 um did a couple of tours of Iraq Northern Ireland um and yeah I had a had a great career um obviously lots of lows lots of high points losing friends on operations was you know obviously the ultimate low and um, I always find it really important to to tell their story, you know, and 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 if I give presentations and things, I'll always put their faces up on slides because, you know, to 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 pay the ultimate sacrifice for your country is, you know, it, it well it is what it is. It's um, you know nobody got, joins the army thinking they're going to lose mm-hmm. their lives or, or or pay that price. So um, for me, you know, huge respect and still today for the armed forces and the job they do. I, I still think they often. We don't seem to value them enough in in modern day society, but um, it's it's for people like those who who allow us to speak freely, do freely. You know what we do in in this day and age. Yeah, it's difficult as well because <clears throat> war is war, and it's, it, no matter what country you're fighting for or what where you're going, it's difficult because I d- I don't think you can justify losing lives or fighting for someone, but it's. It's difficult, especially seeing all that trauma. Because I've had um, Colin McLachlan on. Mc- yeah, yeah, I know Colin. Um, yeah. Um, we speak about PTSD where, um, very openly and it's difficult especially if you're seeing people dying and it fucks with you mentally as a human being I don't think we should be seeing that stuff I don't think we should be looking at that and thinking it's just it's grim because so many men are struggling just now suicide is on the rise and it doesn't help that I don't think there's enough things in place for people to go and open up and speak to us um, a lot of men have got too much pride to open up and it's difficult when you've got guys like Colin and yourself who open up about their struggles and seeing bad things, which is I think is a good thing because it makes other people realise it's okay to speak out and it's okay to have problems. When you were in, because you were, were you a, neg- but not a negotiator, but interrogator? Yeah, it was part of my job. I was in a tank regiment, um, my sort of normal trade, but I ended up being a, a tactical questioner interrogator, mm. um, which essentially meant dealing with with the bad guys the yeah. enemy prisoners and extracting information that we could use um for for military operations to um to counter counter insurgency operations to to hopefully put them under arrest and detain mm-hmm. them and prosecute them um which wasn't always easy but it was it was it was challenging and presented a lot of different issues because i know you were on the the hunted so that's kind of searching people get looking for people and catching them and yeah, that's, absolutely. that's a more fun side that side of things yeah. but it kind of it's kind of the same thing. Did that when you were in the army? Did, how did that affect you mentally? Yeah, I think it was it was really it was really tough actually. Um, you know, I, people talk about things like post traumatic stress disorder. I always say, let's drop the disorder. I always say that it's not a disorder because actually, you know, seeing things and experience things that are abnormal 
you can't expect a normal reaction. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the human body and the human mind is very complex. If you're seeing people being killed on a regular basis, if you're putting friends in body bags, that's not a normal set of circumstances. So you're not going to have a normal reaction. So for me, I don't believe it's a disorder. I think it's a very normal reaction to mm -hmm. a set of abnormal circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, like, you know, Colin's doing a great job, but it is important for people to speak out and, and to talk about these challenges because, as you rightly say, um, we're losing a lot of people on a daily basis now, uh, veterans especially, mm -hmm. um, through suicide, through attempted suicide. You know, and the suicides are the only ones that we often hear about. But homelessness as well. Homelessness as well. Um, so many issues in the, in the not just with veterans, but in the wider community and in, in, in the social circles. But to answer your question, um, yeah, it, it was tough, but I, I always try and take positives out of these negative situations, which isn't always easy at the start. When it's happened, you know, you, you're in that sort of negative mindset. But I think I use reflection quite a lot to sort of take the lessons um, I'm somebody who will go away and digest what's happened, digest a discussion um, and reflect at the end of the day on, you know, whether it's a, an argument with your missus or, or, or a fallout with your, your family or whether it's on operations in the military. I think reflection is, is a, a key part of our growth as an individual to, to because we often act emotionally and, and we don't often think logically. We, we think with our emotions, we say mm. things we don't mean, we do things that we don't want to do. Um, so I think, you know, reflection is, is really important and, and that's something I've come to respect and appreciate a lot more as I've got older. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, again, it must be difficult because as human beings to be seeing that stuff, but again, it's how you react to that as well. And the strongest men have became also the weakest where they've, I wouldn't say it's a weakness, but mentally they became weak where they think it's a better option to take their own life, which is difficult. And it's not just men who serve, serve the country, it's, it's anybody that can be the most successful businessman. Even you've seen a lot of musicians lately as well. It's difficult. Do you think all the stuff you're doing, like the running, the rowing, and pushing your, your mind and body to the limits, do you think that's to balance out some of the stress that you went through in your life and seeing some of the dead bodies and stuff to kind of balance it out and get that natural chemical, the feel-good factor, the endorphins, the serotonin, and, and f try to balance out a bit of the anxiety and stuff? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I got asked recently, you know, I still take medicine, uh, medication today. I, I still take uh, sertraline and I've st started on 100 milligram down to 50, 25 now. Um, but I would always say that running or exercise is the best medicine in the world. Um, it, you know, you get them feel good factors. It's good for the mind. It's good for the body. Um, so without a doubt, you know, even though I'm doing these these crazy adventures for charity, it's helping me mm -hmm. equally as much, if not more, than it is the people who are benef benef benefiting. Yeah, definitely. And exercise is a key to, to be feeling good, even if it's walking. doesn't matter if it's going up the stairs or even walking around the corner, just getting out and getting fresh air. And again, medication, it's not something I really agree on, but if it does help people to a certain extent. What's the medication you're taking and what's the effects of it? Because a lot of medication as well, it tells you on the box that you can be suicidal and it's trying to yeah. prevent suicide. So for me, it, it, I struggle with that. Too. Yeah, no, I, do you know what? I completely agree. Um, I'm not a, someone who is promoting or an, endorsing medication because mm. actually I, I, you know, I was really against it and still am in, in many respects. But I think when you've tried it and you've tested it, um, if you can feel the benefits of it, um, I think, it, you know, they, they tell me that all that the specialists, the doctors tell me it, it helps balance the chemicals in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, I was always and still am fearful that you become reliant on it and you can never get off it. Um, and, and, you know, I'm trying to withdraw slowly at the moment. Um, but if it does help you, then, I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, if, you, if it's the help that you need and the help that you can get, why not? But like you, I'm skeptical. The It's a pharmaceutical injury. Uh, pharmaceutical industry is a business. Yeah. You know, people's businesses, companies rely on you buying drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the downsides and negatives to it. I completely agree. Yeah, they're creating customers. They're not creating Your cures. solutions. Do you know what I mean? So it's difficult. But if you are having serious mental problems and if something can help you pull back a couple of steps, then go by all means get yourself help but the running the, that's fine the walking the exercise the feel good factor and try to wean yourself off listen I'm not a fucking doctor I'm not here to say do this and do that but for people who I've spoke to who it's try to get off the medication they struggle with the hardest because then they rely on it because I had a guy called Mark Dempster in who's a um, counsellor and he says that a lot of people have chemical imbalances where they don't get that enough endorphins to the brain so we either crave it from drink drugs sex to get that extra wee boost yeah. and obviously the pharmaceutical drugs come into play as well because it picks up your 
you had buzz, but then eventually does drop again, and then you become yeah. Oh, I, if first. I miss a few days, I have a, a really you know it takes me to a quite a low place. If I you know sometimes I go away for the weekend and I forgot my tablets, I can after two three days I can feel I'm like a different person. My my girlfriend will tell you. You know, she'll say to me most frustrating things. She'll go, "You haven't had your tablets, have you?" <laughs> and, she'll, and, she, and she'll see a distinct yeah. change in my behaviour, mm-hmm. um, where I'm I'm quite snappy. You know, things will I'm, I'm very irritable. Things that wouldn't normally bother me mm-hmm. um, will get on my nerves quite quickly. So there is a distinct uh, behavioural change, um, and then I'll go back on the tablets, and I'm all right again. And you know, that is not a positive thing. Um, but it, it, the tablets at the moment, they're working for me. Do I want to be on them forever? Absolutely not. And mm-hmm. I'm doing my best to get off them. But you identify it, you're aware of it, and you're very intelligent to realise that what you want anyway. And if it's helping now, then it's good. But again, is when you're going through the agitation stage or the two or three days, is that you or is that wearing off the tablets coming through your system? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. No, so it's difficult because everything has a side effect. And a lot of people promote weed and say joints are great, this and that. But... If you, they did a test actually the scientists did a test they did a test on the brain they did it through alcohol they did it for sex um, meditation and like ayahuasca and stuff like that, psychedelics so they did a test on the brain when you take these stuff how much the brain reacts and, and the, the best chemical your brain receives when you're taking these stuff alcohol get an 8 out of 10 I think um, sex got a 9 out of 10, psychedelics got a 9.5, and the one that got a 10 out of 10 was the meditation, and there was no come down from it either. The other three who give you that really? extra buzz, there was always a come down from it. The, the meditation was a 10 out of 10, so basically taking control of the mindset, yeah, yeah. even techniques. It's and, funny you say that. I've just been started doing yoga about a month ago, yeah. and I've found it so therapeutic mm-hmm. and um, what, what you know? One yeah. of the highly recommend it to anybody because it's a natural buzz. We're we're a hundred mile an hour. The brains always say it's sixty thousand thoughts a day, so it's constant. So you actually, take half an hour, an hour out your time, and breathe, exercise, quiet down the mind, and focus on the day. Because if you're taking all the other stuff to replace it, a lot of people smoke weed and they say, "Oh, I need that. It makes me do things, and or it makes me lazy." A lot of people who smoke weed are already lazy anyway, or a lot of people who smoke weed. We're already active. So again, it's you're kind of trying to numb something. You're kind of trying to help, help hide for the pain. So again, those scientists, it was 10 out of 10 was um, meditation, breathing techniques, quiet in the mind. I can believe that. And the rest Definitely. was all like a, stim- a, a short stimulator for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And then it becomes a, a so low. Because you do a lot of stuff now for the kids all around the world. Raised over a million pounds. What made you get into that? I think... Um... For me, the realize you know a lot of ex-military or veterans they will talk about the the bombs and the bullets, or not that they'll talk about, but the things that would affect their mind would be the things that they'd experienced and, and saw. And it's the same for me, but it's not so much the the trauma or the bombs, the bullets, the blood. For me, it was always the faces of the children. I always think when you see children in a conflict zone or a war zone, mm-hmm. I think that you know. For me, they're the ultimate victims of war because they have no say, they have no influence on being there. You know, they've been mm-hmm. brought into this world. They can't just get up sticks and leave and, and 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 go somewhere else. You know, a lot of them have lost their family, they've lost their homes, and there's just something. There's there's a there's a, a sheer innocence, I think, about children in a war zone. Um, you know, I, I met a child recently, a little boy from Syria who was nearly seven years old. He'd only ever known war, you know, so when bombs were dropping in, he didn't even flinch anymore because that was just normal to him. Conditioned himself. Yeah, he was conditioned himself naturally by the mm-hmm. environment he was living in. And that's that's pretty sad for me. And as, as I say, I think to help the children for me is is the most important thing because they're the next generation, you know. Um, adults, although, yeah, they're important and we can help them, they have an element of control over their mm-hmm. lives. They can get up, they can do something, they can change their path, they can influence tomorrow. Whereas for a child, it, you know, it's pretty doom and gloom if if you're in a war zone. Yeah, you're innocent in the first seven, eight years in your life is at the stage where your brain becomes a sponge and you, you absorb everything in that you've learned or you've seen. So you become, a, I always say, you become a product to your environment. Yeah, absolutely. So it doesn't matter if you grew up in knife crime, drugs, whatever it is, it becomes a norm. So for these kids to accept that it's normal for people to places to get bombed for to see dead bodies, it's scary because we're all human beings. I don't give a fuck what religion you are. I don't give a fuck um, what country you're fighting for. We're all human. We all, yeah, bleed, we all bleed the same. Our heart pumps the same. We've all, we're all connected in my eyes, I believe. And, and again, I always say this, but it's easier to control the masses if people are divided. And it's difficult to see 
such fatalities in the world where it becomes normal. But again, social media, like mainstream media, don't help that because it's constant wars, rapes, robberies. The world is a good place also. And if you don't think it is, then become good yourself. But again, you're doing a, a lot of good stuff and trying to give back. Do you think that's because are you, the misery and the pain you've seen as well, or the tragedies of the lost families, you're trying to help to? Um, I think so. I think I think when you go there and doesn't doesn't have to be a war zone and, I, and you don't have to be a soldier, but I think if you go and see something firsthand um, anywhere in the world or even in your own cities, you know, like the homelessness, the, the great work that you've done, if you, if you see it every day firsthand, you know, you, you feel almost... I think I think human nature says if you can do something to help people, you should do, especially if you're in a position where you can, whether it's because you've got a voice of influence, whether it's because you're financially in a position to support. Um, and, and I think it's no different. You know, I, I'm not many people, certainly from the UK, will will voluntarily go to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and, and try and help um, because it's a war zone. It's a dangerous place, mo most people see. Um, you turn on the news and you'll see lots of negative things. But actually, if you get out there and you meet the mm -hmm. people... You know, I, I did an interview recently with um, with the BBC and I came back from Iraq and Afghanistan and they said, you know, you're, you're crazy. You go into a war zone on your own with no security teams and you're going running. That's, that's pretty reckless. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very dangerous. I said, no, no. I said, I went to... I went to Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia. I didn't see any any stabbings, any shootings, but I got back and in Manchester there was three stabbings with murders. There was mm -hmm. two in London, there was one in Glasgow, but I didn't see any of that when I was in Afghanistan. Yeah. Everyone was very friendly. They welcomed me into their homes. They looked after me. Um, and as you say, the media control the minds. They control the masses of the world. And mm -hmm. we, we're in tune to think that, you know, dare I say it, uh, anybody who comes from ex community are bad people now yeah. you know because that's what the media or that's what yeah. different narratives have portrayed but like you I, we're all humans we're all people and it's only a very small minority you know we get lots of we get lots of bad guys from blackpool who are my age we get yeah. lots of bad guys from glasgow from glasgow from baghdad mm -hmm. from Kabul. you know yeah. bad people exist mm -hmm. uh, my, my my dad used to say when i was a kid he used to say it we call it the dickhead rule mm. uh, the, the, there's dickheads everywhere in the world and you'll always get which <laughs> is true it's true isn't it of course. including myself everybody's yeah. had that kid yeah, one yeah, time or another do you know what point. i mean we all make mistakes but that's where the mainstream media kick in when you see the bad things you think oh that's bad and we portray it that it's normal to go to other countries because britain as well we've invaded every other country bar, yeah, tw yeah. bar yeah. 22 so i think there's only 22 countries ever invaded so I, again, it's who are we fighting for? Yeah. Also, you've got to ask yourself the question, are we fighting for because our country is in danger? Are we fighting for the elite who's what to be more powerful? I question everything. And we yeah, spoke yeah. about that earlier. Everything's a conspiracy to me. Unless I've seen it with my own eyes, I don't know. Yeah. It's it's difficult. When you, when you were over in Iraq and Afghanistan, how are these places and how are the people? I find, I find the people who we would perceive in the West to have nothing are often the most generous, mm -hmm. the, the happiest. You know, you go. I, I, I went to Afghanistan, Iraq. I spent a lot of time there. I see more smiles there than I see in the West, in England. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we live in a society now where our head is down. It's in our phone every five yeah. minutes. You know, we're, we're influenced by what someone's tweeted, what mm -hmm. someone's posted. Um, you know, we're, we're, we live in a society that we're, we're all self-obsessed. Mm -hmm. You know, from, from filming on Hunted, you know, I learned that the UK is the most surveillanced country in the world. We're also the most fame hungry, even compared to the US. We post more about what we're doing. We take more pictures than anyone else based on the size of the country and the ratios. It's incredible. You know, you, you, you know what everybody's doing at every moment of the day. Mm -hmm. And that's a culture. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's a culture that we now live in in a society. Um, people in places like Africa, places like Afghanistan, they, they don't worry about this, that, you know, they, 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 having a phone and tweeting and things is alien to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're worrying about playing out uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the mountains with the children, doing all the things that we might have done 20 mm -hmm. years ago. We're from, a, we're from a very different generation. We have different priorities and the, the world is changing um, a lot. And I think there's still, what you find in, in these remote parts of the world is there's something quite nice and peaceful. Even when I was in Scotland for the mm -hmm. last two or three days in the north, you know, being switched off with no signal for 48 hours is something quite refreshing yeah. about that still today. Your brain, the, the most relaxed, as scary as it sounds, the most relaxing time I had was actually when I was seven days homeless because I never had a phone. Yeah. And I st had so much time to think and analyse my life and think, right, what do I want to do? I, s I looked at my phone yesterday. I spent 11 hours on my phone. It's the app, this, this new tell you how long 11, your screen time is, is scary, I, I, isn't it? 11 hours, yes. I get it. It's my work, but... 
For me, I'm not living. I, f- I don't feel as if I'm utilising my hours more constructively. I'm craving a likes. I'm craving yeah, yeah. attention because I'm self-seeking that way. It's, I'm getting that endorphins. If you've got that chemical yeah, yeah. imbalance, if people are saying, oh, you're doing a great job, you're constantly buzzing. So we're absolutely. constantly craving that to balance that out. So it becomes what's real and what's fake anymore. And, yeah, and, and, absolutely. And, and, I, I, think, I think you raise a great point there. And I think, you know, we, we, we have sort of our Insta world and we have normal world yeah. and... You know, somebody said to me last night, like, somebody said, Jordan, you're doing a great job, you know, and I posted a video of me running through, <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm now at the side of the road in a camper van, I'm freezing, mm-hmm. I'm eating some, you know, some some sandwiches from the garage that are out of date mm-hmm. um, from yesterday, mm-hmm. and I thought, that is not... But I'm, not, but I'm not posting that on social media, yeah, yeah, telling yeah. the world that. Mm-hmm. I'm showing them of how great it was at the end of the race, you yeah, know. Yeah. And it's two different sides, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> there's always, again, there's always different sides to our story. We always portray our life to be great, but I always say, if the lives are that really great, we don't need to post about it. No, no. But again, it's self-seeking. Yeah. If we've got the chemical imbalances, we get, that's just what we're creating yeah, it on. So. These, this fake shit, the illusion, and uh, the big guy, Mark Dempster, again, who had on last week, he was saying that... Um, like your great great grandfather, the stuff that you see nudity online, we see it more porn than nudity in thirty settings than your great grandfather did in his whole fucking lifetime. Yeah. So people's mindsets are changing. We're looking at everything, everything different. It's not natural. No, it's not. It should be natural in the mountains, up at running or exercising. We're not hunting, going about fucking killing everything. But you know what I mean. It's yeah. to be an. A, but even a picture, you know, my missus will kill me for saying this, but she'd tell me off because it's not been filtered before I before, <laughs> before I post it. Yeah. You know, I, I take a picture at the family wedding or whatever, mm-hmm. and you can't go up yet because it's not been. It's not had a filter yeah. on it. And like, you know, and it's just the mm-hmm. world's gone bonkers. Yeah, hasn't it? Isn't it? But again, that's to control the masses. Again, it's easy to control people with their phones. And David Dyke I had on last week speaks about it, and it's fucking interesting that how people because he believes that people are going to get chipped soon. And because they're so, they, they queue out for days to get the new iPhone, so there's so much technology, yeah, they yeah. think it's going to be acceptable to actually get chipped, and then you're easily more Scary. controlled. You do a lot of ho- you, like, you do all the, the children's stuff, so I've lot, wrote down some figures um, for like, charities and the children. There's 1.9 million children raised in war and conflict. Yeah. There's 28, mil- 28 million children who are homeless due to war, and there's over 250 million children living countries attacked by war that is scary fucking fucking figures that is it's right it powerful powerful statistics and you know well we sit here in our in the comfort of our own homes and you know the amount of money that we throw away and waste um you know and what i, I believe that you know we're never going to change the world but we can change the world for a handful of people out there just by making a little bit of difference. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be giving any money. It can be volunteering you some time. You know, there's lots of ways you can help. Mm-hmm. Even raising awareness. Yeah. Um, Even it, speaking you know, to someone for two minutes. Someone, yeah. Like, yeah. Like the homelessness, you know, just taking the time out of your day. Mm-hmm. You don't have to give them any money. You don't have to buy them a drink. Just just acknowledge them. Yeah. And the scary thing about war as well, we spend throw-ins on it. Yeah. And they say only... It would only one of the most lucrative industries yeah, in the world. Yeah, yeah. And it says it would, for to wipe poverty or world poverty, it would only cost £175 billion to give everybody food and shelter. And, and we're, the stats are saying that we spend billions and trillions on war. Yeah, so again, incredible. the world can be a great place. And I hopefully, I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but I believe people are waking up. I believe people are becoming more aware of what's their surroundings and what's right and what's wrong. As soon as we're born, we know what's right and what's wrong. But again, you're a product of your environment, whether it's growing up in Iraq or whether it's growing up in Glasgow or Blackpool. You get conditioned, you're labelled as soon as you're born. You you become a product of your mum and dad as well. Maybe it's their religion, their beliefs, yeah, football yeah. team. You're given a name. You're given. You but like, but like you, I think I'd encourage people to challenge the narrative, challenge the perceptions. Mm-hmm. Go and have a look for yourself. You know, don't believe everything you hear. Mm-hmm. Don't believe everything you see. Go go out there first and and. And, and take a look for yourself because, um, you know, it's, it's quite eye-opening when you get out there and mm-hmm. start speaking to people instead of just believing what you see and hear. Um, people are good. People are genuinely yeah, they are, good. Yeah. They're good. Yeah. Uh, we were down London, but people... You sounds say, so surprised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's... People, they're so caught up, though. Their, their heads are down and they're rushing. I mean, you say hello, you try to be nice. People, they go, oh, he's fucking crazy. Yeah. I just want <laughs> to make conversation. I'll try and make conversation with everybody because everybody's got a story. I love to hear people's stories, their background, where they're from, what they're doing. But people sometimes are thrown back when you actually make conversation. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yes, so I was in... Um, I was in Somaliland, in northern Somalia, in February last year. 
a group of Muslim uh, female women, they invited me into the home and they made me a cup of tea and they chatted to me in broken English. And I, and I remember thinking that evening, I got back to my hotel and I was thinking, that wouldn't even happen anywhere in the society that I mm -hmm. live in. You would never get a group of Muslim women um, inviting me and saying hello to me, acknowledging me, looking me in the eye. It goes against all the stereotypes that I had thought about a Muslim women. That they, yeah. you know, and, and I just thought, and that's in a Muslim country as well, you know, because I've been tuned to believe that that'd be really bad. What you know, for them to do that, mm -hmm. that would be against all their faith, their religion. It go against their family code of conduct, the morals. But actually, it was just, they're just people. They were exactly. nice people. Exactly, they were all human. And I read as well that there was there's 38 million churches in this world, 38 million. But yet they say there's over 200 million who are homeless yeah. as well. And this is supposed to be a religion that love and peace and this and that. Why is there so many empty fucking churches? Why not? Why is it not opened? And again, the Catholic Church as well is a billion dollar industry. Yeah, yeah. Make billions and billions and billions of pounds. And I'll, again, I always question things. What's the motive behind that? Are we really helping people? Where's the money going and stuff? Because I know you give a lot of your money to the kids. And we spoke about earlier, some big charities only give like five and six percent. Yeah, back, so which is a major factor. So we can touch on that a wee bit. That the stuff that you do, you've raised over a million quid, which is unbelievable. It's phenomenal. So fair play. No, I think with the with the um, the charities, as you say, a lot of them are being run like commercial beasts, commercial operations, almost like limited limited companies in many respects where they've got high-level salaries, you've got CEOs on six-figure sums. Um, for me, I'm not saying it's right. or right. For me, it's, it's not what I believe in. Um, I think it's unethical. I think, and people, I have debates about this all the time, you know, people will tell me that, no, you need a very experienced entrepreneur, businessman to be innovative, to be creative, to bring the money in, to, to motivate the staff and, and all this. But I just think when you're talking charity, charity is not about paying people large mm -hmm. sums of money. Uh, when you look at the statistics on what percentage of your your donor or your sponsorship goes to the aid of where it's supposed to go, um, it's pretty, pretty eye-opening, which is why we ended up setting up a charity called Frontline Children, uh, which is a charity that I'm a trustee of. We have no salaries, so we we know that 99% of every penny mm. um, and every pound goes directly to the aid where it's needed. Uh, and on the odd case where money is needed, it's, it's typically be an expense for some sort. But even down to flights into Afghanistan, Iraq, Africa, they're normally sponsored. Yeah. Um, every, and I, th I think there's a, a big gap in the charity market for showing the donor exactly where the penny goes. You know what, I, I tell anybody, if you're gonna drop a pound in a bucket or you're gonna spend 10 pound on a, an online charity page, just dig a bit deeper and scratch beneath the surface to see where that money's going because, you know, sad as it is to say, more often than not, you're gonna be funding um, a lot of people who are earning a lot of money somewhere. Yeah, uh, I had a guy called Brad Welsh on, um, good guy from Edinburgh, and he was exposing some of the charities that are constantly got adverts for people who are just donating money, but the money's, he looked it up, the money's going fucking nowhere. Yeah, yeah. There's um, pallets and there's like, vans and vans of toys that are just sitting there. And it's, um, you've got to question it where it's going. And the non funders, the ones who are doing it themselves, you're creating all the charities to pay for it. And I get people need to survive and they've got families to feed, that's great. But if you're only giving 6% back and 4%, then nah. the only thing you're feeding is your own fucking pockets. Yeah. If you put a pound in a bucket and then you get, if you knew that only 6p out of that pound mm. was actually going to where you thought it was, I, I, I'm pretty sure that most people wouldn't be putting that pound in that yeah. bucket. So you're running, you did, the, the running Somalia, Afghanistan and Iraq. Yeah, yeah. You did a, a, a marathon, a 10k and a 5k, a yeah. marathon, half marathon, 10k. Yeah. So how did that come about? Um, it was just that, you know, I, I needed to go back to these countries to, I guess, deal with some of my own challenges in my mm -hmm. head. I wanted to go back and uh, see the people. I wanted to help raise, we raised about 100,000 100, plus for that. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, I always try and do things differently. Do you do it yourself? Yeah, yeah, completely on my own. And, and are you safe enough or does there people try to take your life or? I do, I do all the risk assessments and I, you know, manage every risk accordingly. Uh -huh. Um, I was diagnosed with epilepsy a couple of years ago, so that was, for me, one of the biggest risks, you know, having a seizure without the right medical support and things. Right, so how do you deal with that then? So for me, it was training people who I met in, letting people know awareness, uh -huh. training them what to do if I had an incident. I wear um, a medical wristband. Um, I, I have it in Arabic as well, so people could, if they found me, they could know what to do with me. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, just awareness. But, but again, it was showing people, even with epilepsy, that, because the, the doctors and nurses said, you can't do this project. It's too much stress on your body, extreme climates, uh, dangerous. It's not good. It goes everything against what epilepsy, you know, says. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it was, 
so I started challenging it, saying, who said this? What, some some doctor who doesn't have epilepsy, mm-hmm. who's never ran a marathon, told me that I can't do it. Well, you know, let's start, yeah. let's start challenging that. Mm-hmm. And the same with the rowing. You know, somebody said, this, this can't be rowed, it's too dangerous. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully... By the end of October, I'll show you that it can yeah. be rowed. Um, and again, it's people up here. The mindset, which is very powerful. So for anybody watching or listening, you can achieve what the fuck you want in life. 100%. Don't let people tell you you can't do anything. Everything in this universe has been created by a thought and belief. Look at the guy who ran the first mile under four minutes. It took hundreds of years for people to do that. And as soon as he done it, then people started doing it week in and week out. Again, it's just to break that mould and break down those barriers that you can achieve anything. So fair play to you for no stopping because... Again, you're going away for your missus and the fear can kick in and what if this, what if that? We're all going to die. Yeah. We're all going to fucking die. Yeah, Why? Yeah. I'm not going to sit in my house and wait for death to come knocking at my no, door. No. Do you know what I mean? And so- I'm a big believer that everyone, in that, in that respect, I'm a big believer that, that everyone's got an expiry date. I don't, you know, I don't, you know, people say, have different philosophies and different theories and beliefs, but for me, all our cards are marked and when it's time to go, we'll be going. Exactly. Uh, you know, so make the most of it. Exactly. And I, I, I know people who've done three, four tours of Iraq, Afghanistan, and then fell off a motorbike in the UK and, and died, you know, mm-hmm. but survived four rounds with the Taliban, you know, for two yeah. years. Um, it, it's time to go, it's time to go. Exactly, so there's no point in sitting in your house. But again, that's fear. People are too scared to make take risks and yeah. take chances. You can live in cotton wool all you want, but you can drop dead down with dead in a heart attack at fucking 18. It's just, when you, again, just go out and do it. Pull the, uh, yeah, uh, take a risk, yeah. get out your comfort zone. I find... With great risk, with great risk, often comes great reward. If you're prepared mm. to, you know, to put mm-hmm. yourself out there and do something, um, you know, you, you'd be amazed. And it's quite addictive as well because when you realise the benefits and you see the success mm-hmm. from it, um, and I said, in fact, not even success. I think there's, I think you can go through life and you can be successful maybe in in love, in business, in your job, in the workplace, whatever it might be. But you can be successful, but often not feel fulfilled. Mm-hmm. And I think if you try and help other people. And you can also do something you enjoy, which for me is adventure. You know, that is fulfilling, which is different than success. Definitely. Fulfilling is, is so fulfilling yeah. is internal. It's, yeah. you know. But that's within. And you see guys like David Goggins who pushed herself to the absolute limits, run 100 miles, 150 miles. Mentally, they can push themselves. You can't do it. You're too fat. You're too heavy. He had a hole in his heart. He's just fucking done it. Yeah. Don't let anybody tell you what you can and cannot yeah. do. Same as yourself, going out and running, traveling the world. But again, if we've got those chemical imbalances, when you're setting those goals and achieving them, that sense of fulfillment for you, you cannot buy that in any medication, any drug, any drink, no matter what, that's where you feel alive. And that's why you constantly crave it and keep doing it. Same as myself, setting goals, achieving them, doing good things, because it's a natural buzz. It's a natural chemical to fucking feel good. And in life, that's what it should be all about. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult, again, because we do live in a material world and we do, some people make their success through materialism or through money but again it's the things that are free the things that you're doing to make other people feel good and other people are rewarding from it so when you do your role as well this year what's the role and how long is it for so the role will take a couple of days hopefully um the, i get the boat in about two weeks it's being built specifically for this mission mm-hmm. if you like um and i'll head out to the horn of africa i'm going to wait out there till the stars align, the conditions are perfect, the mm-hmm. security situation, the weather, the sea state, all the different risks. Mm-hmm. You know, pe- people think when you do these these big expeditions, you know, people think that, oh, it's really dangerous, it's really tough, enduring. Actually, it's the everything that comes before the expedition, the sponsorship, the training, mm-hmm. it's it's the stuff, it's the stuff that goes on behind the scenes that no one ever sees, which is the hard bit. Yeah. You know, doing the actual row across the water, that's the enjoyable bit. That's where, you know, the spotlight's on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, the, mm-hmm. the, 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 the Nobody sees the struggle behind the No, no, again, no. you see there was quotes on your saying boat as well, is the the hours it is like thousands and hours thousands and thousands of hours of training. But yet when they won the Olympic gold medals, the hundred meters and two hundred meters it only showed yeah. like two two minutes of all the running he did, yeah. but it never showed you the thousands and thousands of hours it put in to run those two minutes to win the free consistency, free consistent gold medals and free Olympics. And that and that's what people see on the social media. They see success. They don't. It's what they call it the iceberg effect, don't mm. they? You know, it's like no different than a podcast. You, yeah. you, 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 people think you stick a camera on and you go. You yeah. don't realise there's logistics, there's editing. Of course. You know, there's sound technicians. Mm-hmm. There's the guys that people can't see behind yeah. the camera. <laughs> Just as well for that, though. <laughs> I bet I'm the first guy to give you the mention. <laughs> <laughs> I'll edit that out. <laughs> I do all this myself. Um, but again, consistency is key. The key to everything is consistency. 
people don't people fail after two or three attempts because they think it's too hard. But everything consistency, consistency yeah. is key. And they take failure the as well. Yeah. If you don't get it first, you've time, got to fail. You've got lessons. to fail. You've got to, you've got to fail. That's where process. you learn. That's where you grow. Do you know what I mean? So how can people get in contact with your charities? How can people support you? How can people look in your social media and stuff and find out what your next activities are? Yeah, um, on my website, uh, jordanwiley.org or at Mr. Jordan Wiley is my handle on on all platforms. Um, I got a book out uh, which details my time in the military and what I did after the army, fighting pirates off Somalia. Uh -huh. How can we get the book? Uh, the book's available in, in Waterstones, all good bookshops, Amazon, mm -hmm. um, or find it on the website. And the new book, which will document last year's running project which is called running for my life that'll be out in uh, the 7th of november this year um but yeah we're a big year ahead looking forward to it yeah good i'm excited for you and you were on channel four's hunted yeah so i was on that i'm a hunter on hunted um we start filming the new series uh 25th of may so mm -hmm. coming up soon um which will go on for a couple of months um so we'll be i'll be running around the uk um, and driving around the UK, so pretty much doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Carrying it on. So how did how was the celebrity one? Is that run for 14 days? Yeah, celebrity one's 14 days, and the sort of main series is is just short of a month. Um, the celebrity one is it's for stand up for cancer, so mm. it's got a charity aspect to it. Um, it's a bit more fun. It's obviously quite hard for celebrities because mm. people know who they are, so it's not as easy for them to hide in the yeah. in the public domain. Who because was it Jamie Lang, Spencer Matthews? Yeah, they were um, on the first one. Yeah, they were on the first, on the last one. We had um, some guys from Love Island, Chris and Kem. We had um, some politicians. We had Kay Burley from Sky News. Um, some Strictly Come Dancing people. Um, celebrities but I don't really know who a lot of them are <laughs> so how does it work then so what is the plan for them to get do they have money and they try and hide from you no, so, so, so they got to they got to go on the run right if they get to the end mm -hmm. they get to an extraction point um, so on the main series they got say they got 30 days if they get to day 30 and they get on the extra, they get to the extraction point which could be a plane it could be a helicopter it could be whatever you know mm -hmm. um, they win £100,000 so our job is to stop them getting the hundred thousand pound um so it's pretty brutal as well because you know outside of the celebrity show these people have quit the jobs you know they've applied for hunted they've got on the show they've left work you know i, I i've seen i was you know I, we obviously hack all their accounts their social media their pcs mm -hmm. their laptops I, I i'm reading emails where they've already spent the money you know they've they, they, they're, they're planning what they're doing with the hundred grand mm -hmm. you know they're booking holidays they're putting mm -hmm. deposits down on cars and <laughs> And it's it's pretty brutal, and as you can imagine, when when they get caught, they're pretty mm. aggressive as well. You know, in that in that moment of emotion where they realise there is no hundred grand anymore, yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty, so it's pretty real then that they've actually quit everything because they think they're going oh, to win real. it. You know, people think sometimes that it's set up, it's staged, or it's set mm. up. You know, we might we might reshoot a scene, but what you see is how it happened. Uh -huh. You know, the moment we catch them, the moment we're chasing them, mm -hmm. that's how it, obviously people edit things. People are creative with the editing. Um, no different than any other part. Of course, you're making a show. Yeah, you're making a show ultimately, but it's as real. You know, we don't get a script. We mm -hmm. we do as we see it. We know we find intelligence. We we go and chase them. So is everything bugged? Their phones, their social media? Yeah, the, we're, we're bugging them. The you intelligence. Know, everything, all their phone records, interrogate family members, track their cars, yeah. number plate recognition, you know, whatever it is, you name but it. But you know, just fuck off and then just lay low for the 30 days or do you need to be in about it to try to get to certain points? Yeah, you, you, you need to... You know, you need to keep moving. You need to. People make the same mistakes, though. You know, they use a bank card. They try and contact them more, more. You know, they do all the things that you wouldn't. Do. <laughs> yeah, but they've all got. In fairness, as well, they've all got to get on the show. They've got some incredible backstories. You uh -huh. know, they've been through some real challenges in their mm -hmm. life. You know, whether it be, you know, people we had on last show had uh, several times they'd had cancer. Some had lost their parents. Real and actually lovely individuals, all pretty much all of them, you know. Yeah. And you, and you act, sort of afterwards when you've caught them, you you sort of going on thinking, I wish you'd have yeah. won. <laughs> <laughs> let them go. Yeah, let them go. Because you've got a football. Are you organising a celebrity football match? Yes, yeah, so we've got a celebrity football match on um, Sunday the fifth of May at um, at Blackpool's ground, Bloomfield Road. Um, so um, we've got uh, military veterans uh, who have won sort of gallantry awards people who've been on Colin actually Colin McLaughlin's one of our players oh Colin yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so Hunted SAS who dares wins those sort of guys versus um, Coronation Street Emma Dale Collie Oaks EastEnders and, and the <laughs> like so you can, do, you, do you play yeah yeah I'll play as well yeah and how yeah. have you ever had an episode with epilepsy have you ever had no 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 you know touch wood, touch, touch wood yeah um, I've, I've I the only I'm not one of these you know I, I try and give a positive outlook for mm -hmm. epilepsy I 
for me, it was the only negative I found was um, I couldn't drive for a year. They took my license, so you surrender your driving license for a year. You got to be a year clean before you can. Yeah. Um, but it allowed me to get fit. I started mm-hmm. doing more running because I find that you, even if you just want to go to your local shop these days, ten minutes away, you jump in a car. You know, yeah, you become it, lazy. You yeah. become very lazy. Yeah. And when it's taken away that ability, you realise how lazy you've become. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got fitter, got did more exercise, but. You know, I have a positive outlook on it. I don't see any negative to it. Yeah, do you think that keeps everything at bay? I believe everything can be rewired. I believe everything can be reversed. Um, again, people who have had, like, diabetes and stuff, they've, re- they've reversed it with changing their diet and exercising. Mm. I, I, I don't know many people, though, it's had epilepsy and, and then... Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. You can. You can. When you've got epilepsy, you've got it, and you can. Maybe you won't have another seizure, but you'll yeah. never sort of know till it happens. Uh-huh. But what age did you get? What age? Where Only you... two years ago. And what does it? What does that uh, come from? Stress, anxiety. How no, no. It... So for me, it was a bit. It's quite a unique, um, a unique case. So I went to do a documentary in the Horn of Africa, and I took an American TV channel to to basically go and look at what pirates do off Somalia. So I took them out there. I went on a boat for a couple of weeks and. Uh, I got bit by a mosquito and I caught something called dengue fever, which is like, it's a mosquito born virus, a bit like malaria, similar side effects. Put me in hospital for a few a few months and a side effect of that was people start having seizures and the odd person gets epilepsy. You don't really see it in the UK because you don't have mosquitoes and, and mm. dengue fever, but in Africa, it's quite common. Uh, and I was one of the unfortunate ones that got bit by the mosquito on that time, which is, is, is pretty pretty random. But I always think... Someone gave me a piece of advice a few years ago, uh, uh, a friend of mine called Laura Dees. She's uh, an Olympic, uh, winter Olympian. She won the bronze this year, last year in the skeleton event, you know, where they lie down on the ice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she said to me, I was having a bit of a tough time with the old depression and what have you when I, my family broke down. And she said to me, Jordan, she said, control the controllables. That's the best piece of advice I can ever give you. And, and, I, and I try and apply that to every aspect of my life. You know, just control the things that you can control. Don't worry about anything else because we stress and we build ourselves up about things that we have no influence over, no control. And again, in all business, love, and so on, just worry about what you can control. And if you can control it, then you, what you're worried about because you can do something about it. Yeah. But we worry about things that we can't control mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and they're the things that we shouldn't worry about because we, we can't do anything. It is what it is. Yeah, exactly. How was the, the pirates? Did you see them? Yeah, yeah. So I spent... I spent. How how through are, is it that the the pirates take over ships and the oh yeah yeah big the big yeah. serious yeah so I spent after the military I left in two thousand and nine I spent best part of five years up and down the Somalia coast Indian Ocean West Africa East Africa Southeast Asia uh, protecting ships from pirate attacks um, you know I was. It was a, bull, a multi billion dollar industry for the pirates um, it's, it's died down significantly now um, because. You know, security have done a great job, military operations and so on, but oh, it's in- incredible, yeah, for, for a long time. So when they take control of the ship, where did, where did they take the ship? <coughs> Is the ship not registered? Does it not? Yeah, it's back to Somalia. So, you know, um, in the sort of, in the in the simplest form, pirates get on a ship and they hold a gun to the captain's head and say, your ship's been hijacked, we're going to Somalia now. And, and that's, you know, that's obviously a bit more complex than that, but that's mm-hmm. how, how it is in its simplest form. Uh, yeah, is did they kill the hostages or do they let them go there's been cases where they kill them so so the, the business you know east Af- lots of different types of piracy but the famous one what most people know about if you like mm. or the infamous one is the somali based piracy where pirates would hijack a ship the ship would then be taken back to somalia and then the pirate commanders and leaders they would then try and sell the ship back to the owner and say if you want your ship and your crew and some of these the cargo on board you know oil gas could be worth a couple of hundred million dollars so for them to sell it back for five, ten million dollars, it's a drop in the ocean. If you've got three hundred million dollars of liquefied mm-hmm. natural gas on board, mm-hmm. um, so they, they made a very successful business model. And our job was to protect them. So we were armed security. Um, I also was a, what they call a bag dropper. So I would go and pay the pirates as well. So when they had agreed a fee with the ship owner, the insurance companies would send me out to Somalia to drop a bag with a couple of hundred million or a couple of million dollars in. Um, which was quite interesting. It's quite interesting because people always think that was a really dangerous job. But I can assure you, if you're giving someone $5 million, they don't want to hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to go and meet them with the door? Yeah, it was going to meet So It was, you know, you got. I always use the analogy of, think of think of a drug dealer in, in Glasgow. Think of, um, you know, you've got the guy on the street who's shifting the gear, but then you'll have, you've sort of kingpin further up the chain. 
um, who's calling the shots, you know, who's the guy who probably doesn't get his hands dirty that often, but he's the guy making the decisions. And that's how the pirate chain of command would work. You know, the four or five, six pirates who get on the ship, who do the dirty work, the hard graft, mm -hmm. they, they hijack the ship. You know, you might get a $10 million ransom. They'd be lucky to get 50 right. grand out of that. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. If that, if yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a couple of grand. Mm -hmm. And these are 16, 17-year-olds, uneducated, mm -hmm. poorly trained, limited equipment, you know, rusty old weapons. They're a real chances taking a big risk. Um, and yet you got some guy sat often, often not even in Somalia. You know, a lot of the money was traced back to places like Dubai, even London, New York. You know, they were being funded by some, some serious influential players. I don't yeah. know who, but... You know, a lot of intelligence to suggest that they weren't necessarily all coming out of Somalia. Yeah, they're not sitting in a hut. Just no, no, to, they're not sitting in a hut yeah. when you're getting $10 million yeah. in your bank. <laughs> so when the devil's trying, when you're on the boat, the devil's trying... Yeah, so my boat. book actually, um, it's, like you've, it's like you've played me nicely into a plug for my book now. So, yeah, Cit yeah. so, so, <laughs> so Citadel, the book, so uh, the name of the book, Citadel, a Citadel is is the, is the, the, the technical term for a safe room. So mm. if you imagine... On the ship, the, the plan would be if pirates ever got on board a ship, the crew would always have what they call a citadel or a safe room where they would all go to seek refuge. They would lock themselves in and they would call for the naval forces to come and rescue them. And in there, you'd have like emergency rations, medical kit and whatever else. So on, on, my, on this particular occasion, eight years ago now, I took a ship into Somalia and the, the plan was to deliver, the cargo was for the World Food Programme, we're delivering rice and grain and, and bits and pieces for the Somali people. We didn't have any weapons on our ship because depending on what registration the ship is, what flag it's carrying, depends on if you can have weapons or not on board. Every country's got its own rules around firearms, no different than we have on land. Um, so we were on a ship as the security team, but we didn't have any weapons. So our job would be put the razor wire out, put the fire hoses out um, and come up with like a crisis management plan. Anyway, we went to Somalia. We were supposed to be in and out in 24 hours. We ended up getting delayed, which is quite common in shipping. And the the delay from a few hours went to a few days to a week. Uh, and, and, and as you can imagine, we're sat there off Somalia, the sort of lion's den, the pirate hotspot of the world, off Mogadishu. And pirates, armed pirates, boarded our ship. So I was the security team leader at the time. So I took all the crew, about 20-odd 20, 20 crew, mixed nationality, and my security team, took them down into the safe room in the Citadel. And the drill is, when you're in there, you stay in there and you call for a rescue. So we got in there, we locked ourselves in. I went to use the satellite phone and we we're in a black spot in the ocean, a bit like on your mobile when you haven't got a signal if you like. And, um, and so I was stuck with a problem because if you don't tell someone you're there, nobody's coming to get you. Um, we had pirates on board with rocket propelled grenades, AK-47s. Um, and if you want to know what happens next, you've got to go and buy yeah, the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, <they> bastard. <laughs> I'll find it when the cameras are going. So you're doing the 15 days, 15 marathons. Yeah. You're on your fourth day. How did this become about as well? What was the plan for this? Yeah, literally, it was it was like a week's notice. Um, training? Yeah, no, I didn't. I haven't trained for it um, at all. Obviously, I go to the gym. I'm training for my rowing project, so I'm doing loads of but rowing. But you must be fit then if you can do 15 and 15 days. Well, I ain't done them yet. I'm only on day four, so I'll, I'll tell you next week. <laughs> Text me next week, yeah, make sure yeah. you're alive. Yeah, but um, you know, it's not easy. Um, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm an adventurer. I'm not an endurance runner. I'm not an athlete. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still the guy who on a weekend goes and watches the footy in the pub mm -hmm. and has a beer I'm, I'm you know I love a takeaway every other weekend or whatever so you know I'm not I'm not super fit but I think you know like you a lot of it is resilience in the mind um you know if you believe it that's half the battle probably more than half the battle if you mm -hmm. can believe you can do it um but also breaking it down you know I'm not trying to break any world records here I'm not trying to run you know sub three hour marathons for me it's about doing 26.2 miles every day um, yesterday, today, this morning, when I did Loch Lomond, I broke that down into four 10.5 runs, you know, mm -hmm. um, started at 5.30 this morning and just did four runs and had a break in between each one. Um, I still completed the 26.2 miles. And I think if we approach that same mindset and mentality towards life, we can conquer most challenges and obstacles and problems. Mm -hmm. um, it's sometimes we've just got to look at the bigger picture and, and just think of stepping stones instead of stumbling blocks. Yeah, we try and get everything done straight away. Yeah, we Rome wasn't built in a day and yeah, all that. I think if um, you plan for five years and ten years, you'll soon realise that your dreams and vision actually work. We just want it all now. We want it all yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Instead of breaking down the five-year plan into, again, your four, your four phases for your marathon, breaking it down, your goals, 
daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, yeah. and then by the five year, you'll be reassured, trust me, your goals and dreams will work. 100%. And I think also people need to, uh, we mentioned it earlier, about reflection. When you've achieved something, even if it's doing the local 5K park run, stop and acknowledge what you've done. You yeah. just, just take two minutes to look back and go, I've done that this morning. Mm-hmm. Did it, you know, brilliant, great news. Mm-hmm. I, I think we're so focused so quickly on that tunnel vision, what's next, what's next, what's next, and we stop. We often also forget what's important. We forget to, you know, we've got other people on that journey with us. You never, you never complete anything that's worth doing alone. You know, even though I might be out here in my camper van driving around, you know, I've got a missus who's looking out for me. I've yeah. got people sponsoring, donating. I've got people tweeting, retweeting about the project. You know, it's always a team effort. Mm-hmm. Like you said, Usain Bolt, the amount of people in his support team, you know, yes, he's under the spotlight when it matters, but without them people, you, mm-hmm. you never get to that point in the first yeah. place. Thanks, Steph. That's the one for you, mate. <laughs> is, um, yeah, definitely. And for the plans for the future, for this year, you've got your run, you've got your 15 days, you've got your own. What's the other plans for you? Yeah, Have so. You anything sorted? Yeah, next year's plans, um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep them sort of under wraps, um, but it's going to involve um, going to the ends of the earth, literally. Um, so we're going to the North and South Poles next year, um, mm-hmm. which will be pretty special, uh, but we're going to release all the details of that in mm-hmm. in November. Um, so uh, we've got an abseil of the Angel Falls, Will Tires Waterfall in December this year as well. I'm taking six people who are scared of heights to go and abseil the Will Tires Waterfall, which should be fun. Um, so yeah, lots lots of good projects and always looking out for more. You know, I always tell people if you've got something, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be my project. It might be your project um, or somebody listening if you, if you want us to get involved. I'm, in fact, I'm cycling, uh, helping some guys cycle Paris to... Uh, it's Paris to Blackpool. It's Tower to Tower, Eiffel Tower to Blackpool Tower. They're doing that in June. Um, some lads from Blackpool, so trying to chip in with a few miles for them as well. So, you know, if you're doing a cool project, if it's interesting, if it's for a good cause, you know, give us a shout because if it, you know, I'm always happy to to join and get involved um, because it, it helps me as much as it helps you. Yeah, because it sounds as if you crave the adrenaline as well. That that buzz. Yeah, I think. Doing... Do you know what I think? I think when you when you, especially in hostile environments conflict zones or, or not even that but being out your comfort zone I find that that's when you feel most alive mm-hmm. you know your senses are heightened I feel like you can smell things you can touch things you can hear things at an extreme level when you're out of your comfort zone but people never experience that because 99% of people will live in the comfort zone people believe they can't do things they can't achieve things I'm trying to convince my mum to do a skydive you know she's she's so I'll be careful what I say on her age. She's making that. <laughs> oh, she's too old. Yeah, she's yeah, too old, you know. Yeah. Get out there. Everybody's got blockages. Everybody's yeah, got, yeah. People limit themselves, and that's where people go wrong in life. There shouldn't be any limits. It should be limitless. You can achieve what the fuck you want, no matter if you're 20, 100%. 30, 120. You see guys out in their 80s and 90s doing marathons still. You see guys in the gym doing their 80s and 90s. People give up. Yeah. People accept, and they just become. And not only that, these, these same people who have given up and accepted. They're the people who will drain the life out of your dreams. You mm-hmm. know, I try and dissociate myself uh, from those sort of people. If you surround you surround yourself with positive people, with positive energy, yeah, yeah. Um, because the moment, you know, so many people have already given up on their yeah. dreams that they will convince mm-hmm. you that your dreams aren't yeah. achievable. And it's difficult because if you were to say to someone, you're going to do 15 marathons in 15 days, they're going to tell you why you're doing that. You're crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your back's going to be sore. Your bones are going to be sore. You might take a fit. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Before you know it, because they, it scares them, they fucking scared you out with doing it. Yeah, yeah. So it's difficult. But again, it's it becomes a lonely journey as well, doing things. And I only speak to Steph. <laughs> and I'm constant. I'm on, everything's changing for me. Right? I need that. I'm constantly new ideas. So it's difficult because I don't want to just stay. I don't want to be just one dimensional. I constantly want to grow, which yeah. is difficult. And it's a fucking lonely journey. Do you feel lonely when you're doing all this stuff as well out here on yourself? And no, do you know what? I find it. I find it quite therapeutic. I don't, I don't, I don't see it as a negative. I see it, I see it as time for reflecting, time for you know, sort of analysing where I am, what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't find it lonely, and I'm maybe I'm a bit sad because I'm, I'm quite comfortable in my own. You know, I've, I've got, I love nothing more sometimes than sitting at home in my own company on my being mm-hmm. peaceful. I'm, I'm, and then going out into the public and doing what you need to do. So I don't, I don't really find it lonely at all. To be honest, I find. Maybe I'm a lonely person because I enjoy being on my own. Yeah, but that's good. The, the, the say in life, if you can handle your own your own mental state and being alone, then everything else that comes into your life then becomes a bonus. Do you know what I mean? So sometimes we can be actually lonely in a crowd. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, uh, yeah. And I think with social media, we see that, you know, yeah. you know, people are portraying lives that they don't live and, 
Uh, and, and often when you again when you scratch beneath the surface it's it's a very different reality than what you're probably seeing definitely Jordan and for it, people I know you've already said it but how can people get in contact with your charities or try and maybe um, fund you or help you or any new ideas or your email addresses or social media where people can contact yeah, you yeah yeah please yeah get in touch um, at Mr Jordan Wiley on, on Twitter Facebook YouTube Instagram um, jordanwiley.org the website and even if you're not supporting me um, but if I can help you in any way, if it's you want some advice, you're thinking about doing something, mm. just just reach out. You know, I'll always message you back. Maybe not straight away. Sometimes if I'm mm. busy, but I'll always try and help you if I can. Um, but you know, chase your dreams, believe in it. If you can believe it, you can achieve it. Yeah, I love it, mate. And Jordan, for coming on today, brother, you're doing absolutely ah, cheers, fantastic. And and likewise to you. Yeah. Thanks for having me on the yeah, show. Not you know, a problem, mate. And anything we can help with as well. I'm only a phone call away. What you're doing for the kids and the charity work you're running and you're proving that nothing can hold you back no matter what the fuck you've been through no matter what area you've grew up you're doing amazing work mate and keep it up brother no, i appreciate that Thank cheers you. buddy thank you 